so I will start at the beginning. Always a good place to start. Um, and it sort of sets up the book and lays out the characters. So I will read it. Charlie Christmas knew he was the least likely cowboy in West Texas, unless he counted his dark alter ego, his former self, the Somali refugee, Saeed Awale. There were plenty of African-American ranch hands, but none any blacker than Charlie Christmas, skin the color of coal oil and teeth as white as the polished elephant ivory dice he won throwing craps in the Kenyan refugee camp where he spent two years with what was left of his family after they fled the carnage in Somalia following the aborted American-led humanitarian invasion. And none with friends like Edomar Zarkan, a fourth generation Texan, one of the first Muslim women to have graduated from West Point, and a sniper who struggles to reconcile her role as an assassin and a mother. Stone, an army captain and lapsed Jew who brought them together amid a war and famine in East Africa, the likes of which the world has rarely seen. Or Buck, the fearless mixed breed canine and best friend to the refugee boy who would come to define their life's work. Charlie Christmas was certain of, certain of something else. There wasn't another cowboy in West Texas, or when he, anywhere else for that matter, who had stumbled into the American dream like him. Although some of the time it seemed more like a nightmare. The war in the early 1990s, the ravening pirates, the tragic trek across the Somali savanna to Kenya, the hellish limbo of the refugee camps and the white supremacists who hounded them from Indian country and the badlands of South Dakota to their new home in Minnesota. Through it all, he could count the Zarkons and the laws, iconic families that had carved an agricultural empire 80 miles east of El Paso near the tiny West Texas town of Bell City, financed in large part by a Texas Supreme Court decision that redefined lucrative water rights in the American West. He shared Islam with the Zarkans, all four generations of them, and was certain their ancestors had somehow crossed paths in the mid-1800s when America was importing dromedaries from the Middle East and Africa for the U.S. Army Camel Corps. But he shared something just as deep with the laws, particularly Adamar and Jack, the patriarch who didn't give a shit about religion and whose partnership with the Zarkans dated back to the 1950s Adamar's great-grandfather saved Jack's ass during a brawl in a Juarez canteen. Jack Laws had saved Charlie's ass, too, and his family so many years ago in Kenya. Charlie Christmas never forgot, nor did Saeed Awale. Nearing 70, and with almost a quarter century of life in the United States, Charlie Christmas felt like an American, even amid the chaos of the nation in 2021. Or perhaps, or perhaps because of that chaos and how the hot rush of the danger that rides with it can seem like an old friend. The truth of it was that he felt American the day an army sergeant in Mogadishu who hired him as a translator discovered he was born December 25th, 1952, christened him Charlie Christmas and assigned him to Second Lieutenant Adamar Zarkin. The relationship that began that day would shape their entire lives, but his given identity and name, Saeed Awali, never entirely left him. Life was like that for Charlie Christmas, as it is for many immigrants who cross the burning bridge. Two people living in the same body, one an undertow that pulls them relentlessly back, and the other a wave that pushes them inexorably forward. The yin and yang of the immigrant. Charlie Christmas talked to himself frequently, and those who knew him chalked it off as some kind of tick but it wasn't a tick at all. It was a running dialogue between the forgotten and the forgetful, between the Somali and the American, between Saida Wale and Charlie Christmas. So, Amy? Yes, uh, it looks like Saida Wale has come to America for a better life. I hope you get an opportunity. And yes, sir. He has to start from the scratch. Find a job. And he has a job. And he has a job. So he has to start from the scratch. From the 
about him. For, for him to have a different country and different culture and different aspects. But he's glad that he left. That he's been alive to bring us to that point. And so, is that how you, is that your experience too? That's my experience as well. That's how I can relate it to this. Yeah. But you were, you were younger, man. You were a teenager. Even though I was young, but I still work. Uh, still going to high school and at the same time working in a part time job so I can have, uh, you know, have food on the table. And as, um, as Jeff said in your introduction, you're living the American dream. You're a successful businessman. You got to work hard. Emerging a politician. From the bottom of your heart. And that's how you get to proceed. Even though he came to land in Texas, he came to move from Hawaii. So he came here in Minnesota to find his community. That's related to the title that he came up with the book. He could have stayed in Texas. One of the largest Muslim American are living in Texas. But he came here home to find out that he can relate and stay with, their, with his own community. Um, did you have um, temptations fall off the straight and narrow while you were here? Very different. I was uh, uncomfortable in the first place. It takes me a year to adjust it and to find out the right path. Okay, the um, any, any questions about for a second? Try to cover as much as we can. <laughs> okay, so the um, um, the second passage I'm going to read. Um, it uh, so that's set, the first one I read sets it up. This next one takes place as they are leaving um, Somalia. Um, Char um, Saeed Awale um, leaves Mogadishu with his wife um, and several children and, um, and some friends. And as, as I found out in talking to people who've made this journey, um, a lot of times their family or their friends don't make so Charlie, um, without spoiling the story, only Charlie and his son make it out of Somalia. And this next passage um, takes place right at the Kenyan border. Uh, they've come through the highlands. Um, they've skirted along the border with Ethiopia. And they're standing right there at the border um, with Anamar Zarkon and Prometheus Stone. standing at the border. The irreversibility of it all sank into Charlie as they approached the Kenyan border. He paid a high price. They, all, they had all paid a high price for an illusion of a new life in America. Awil, Ebla, and Samina paid with their lives. Stone and Adamar forfeited pieces of themselves in the journey that they would always feel but never recover like an amputee with a phantom pain in a missing limb. Guilt crept up Charlie's spine, a palpable feeling of shame and disloyalty that settled and stayed. And with it came the scolding words of his other, Saeed Awale. For what, Charlie Christmas, the voice whispered in his ear. Your wife, dead. Your niece, dead. Your son, now a killer before his ninth birthday. What can be worth that? Charlie had no answer. He wanted to cry, but no tears came. Perhaps, perhaps he'd lost that too, somewhere on the Somali savanna, buried under the tragedy of the past month. Charlie's shoulders slumped and his knees buckled from the weight of the emotional gravity. The four of them crested a plateau on just the other side of a border crossing at dusk and dismounted in the gloaming. 
Four generations separated Adamar from the voyage her great-great-grandfather made from Syria with a shipload of camels, but the blood of a refugee ran in her veins. She would always be the other in America, in many ways a nation of others, and perhaps that's what imbued it with the audacity to reach beyond its grasp for, for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain. Perhaps that's what, she, what draws all refugees to the idea of America and bequeaths her with the steel forged from their resolve. The blood of a refugee also ran in stone. The Jewish warrior, the renegade son of a rabbi whose great-grandfather emigrated from Greece for the promise of a new life in America, free from the shtetl of Thessaloniki and its suffocating mythos. Charlie dropped to his knees on the plateau overlooking Kenya and prayed. Amir, Adamar, and Stone joined him, Muslim and Jew side by side, emerging from the desert as the living embodiment of the Passover legend. Buck rested his heavy head on Amir's shoulder as the sun pulled the last shafts of light back into its belt and left them in darkness. Um, so that's punctuation mark on his life in Somalia. Did you ever have that? Yeah. Somalia. You go back to Somalia frequently. I went back to Somalia the first time was uh, two years ago. And yeah, I went, uh, first time when I went back, it was totally different and, and totally different world. But after staying in a month, Understanding the people, sitting with them, and I'm, I was able to go back again and able to help some of the things that they need. Uh, there's so many kids that do not have what I have in America. So that helped me create an organization uh, to give back to kids for books and schools. soccer team uh, that the money came out of totally from the diaspora. So I can relate it to uh, Awale. Even though he lost some of his member family, he was still has to carry on an idea of America and the new life of American dream. Poetic. Yes. Do you ever feel guilty with I lost my brother in the Civil War, and one of us had left family member who got killed or died in the way to come in America. Some of them as a drone because they had to go to ship related to the Syria, Syria refugee who was coming to Texas and to find a better life. I mean, yes, somehow you kind of feel guilty but at the same time, you have to uh, carry on and try to look for a better life while you're still alive and try to give it back to the people that must need it. So that's the idea of America. Um, so this next passage I'm going to read um, is really a tribute to the Somalis here in Minneapolis. Kind of a lighthearted passage. Um, it takes place in Cedar Riverside. Sammy is in it, um, as well as other characters you, who you probably know. Um, and um, so I'll just read it um, and, and enjoy. It starts um, with this woman, Natalie, who is based on a real person in St. Cloud. It's not her real name, obviously. Um, and it takes place over in East Village Grill. Some of the best food in, the, in Minnesota, really. So, Natalie was obviously pregnant with her first child when she met them at the East Village Grill in, in the Cedar Riverside neighborhood of Minneapolis, otherwise known as Little Mogadishu. Almost 10,000 Somalis live within the four square blocks that compose Little Mogadishu, 4,000 of them in Riverside Tower, directly across from the Riverside Mall and Catty Corner to Hubert Humphrey Stadium home of the Minnesota Vikings. 
Amir could not have been happier when Natalie told him she'd arranged an apartment facing the football stadium in one of the six buildings that make up Riverside Towers. Built during the early 1970s in the German brutalist style, with exposed structural elements appropriate for a community that wears so much of its heart on its sleeve. Charlie could imagine he was back in Somali when he looked down South 4th Street, full of Somalis in typical Somali clothes, speaking his language. But that bubble, like so many glimmers of hope in his life, nearly burst when he saw a tag on the wall across the street, spray painted by the Somali hard boys, a local gang of small time thieves and drug dealers, a pirate by any other name, Charlie thought to himself. Don't fret, said Abdi Salah, a rising political star in the civic government that Natalie had brought along as part of the welcoming committee when he noticed Charlie looking at the gang graffiti. We keep an eye on them. Charlie shifted nervously in the booth of the restaurant and looked at his son, then back to Abdi. How old is he, Abdi asked. Eleven, Charlie replied. The hard boys like to get them when they're young, Abdi said, but not that young. Eleven in years, Charlie said, but not so innocent after the last two. He was old enough to remember Mogadishu, the war, the day his school closed, the exodus, his mother's death, the refugee camp. I mean, he killed a man at nine, just a boy. Then he wasn't. I don't know how he stayed so good. I can imagine, Abdi said, 10 of my family fled Somalia. Seven of us made it. It's dangerous, but in some ways simpler. You could see the bad guys coming. Over here, forget it. Minneapolis police, not exactly sympathetic to people of color. Plus, all that shit on the internet, the internet of ideas, ha, huh, what a bunch of camel shit. More like the internet of jackals. Trust your instincts, hold them close with an open hand. Hold the line, brother. Keep him busy with school, sports, anything that keeps him off the street, said Mohammed Farah, head of a local NGO that works with Somalia youth and the government to bolster community resiliency against extremism. And send, send him to us if he has any free time, art, sports, learning. We have something for everybody. And we know who the bad apples are. Idle hands are the work of the devil, said Stone, who perked up as the waitress. Amina, a young Somali woman, asked for the order. Will it be gents, said Amina, whose willowy, nilotic beauty and pearl-white teeth took his breath away. Uh, Stone stammered, awkward silence. Adamar laughed, elbowed him in the ribs. Cap. Cap, asked Amina, whose name means honest in Somali. We served together in the army. Somalia, Adamar said. He's my captain, but he's out now thinking about settling here. I'm still in, just taking some time, some leave to drive our friends up from West Texas. What about you? My name is Amina, obviously, she said, pointing to her name tag and laughing. Not forced, true laughter. Amina Hussein, refugee like everyone around here, 28, usual story, Mogadishu, Kenya, blah, blah, blah. Sorry, I don't mean to be cynical. Everyone misses the past they thought they had, but I like it in America. I have a good job, Almost finished with my master's in computer science at the U of M, full scholarship. Go Gophers. What about you, Captain? Stone recovered. Prometheus Stone at your service. Amina laughed, head back laughed, hand on her hips, elbows at 90 degree laugh, sassy laugh. What should I call you? It's been so long since anyone called me anything but Captain, Cap or Stone. You're a funny guy, she interrupted. I'll call you Cap. At least that's what I'll call you if I see you again. You can call me Sam if you see me again. Suits me fine, Sam, he said. Awkward silence. Stone stared at Sam. Everyone stared at Stone. Well, Cap, Amina said. Well, what, he said. OK, I'm the waitress, you're the guest, and I'm taking your order, she said. Capiche? They all needed a good laugh and they all did at the expense of Stone, who was actually blushing. Jesus, Stone, Adamar said. Love at first sight or what? They all laughed again, the kind of laughter that is the cousin of crying. When the laughter finally stopped, a man in his 30s at the next booth leaned over and extended his hand. She's my little sister. I'm Samakai. Just bring them the breakfast special, the Somali one. Stone didn't realize it. Men like him accustomed to keeping score in all things about their life rarely do. But Adamar did. Women always know when, the de when destiny ripples through the universe. For 
particularly in the affairs of art. Wish I was sticking around to watch this one, Adamar said. Huh? Said Stone. Not sure what he was feeling. I'll be back for the wedding, Adamar said. After they had their fill of Masharo, Yaris, Labin, and Sabayad, Mukmadio, Ukun, mini rice and coconut cakes, yogurt with sumac, pomegranate and basil, and flatbread wrapped around eggs and preserved beef. Beef. Samakab noticed the dusty old football in Amir's lap. Samakab grew up in nearby St. Paul and played tight end for the Arlington High Phoenixes, although he preferred basketball. A former schoolmate was the equipment manager for the Vikings, and during the offseason, they played pickup games in Cavernous Humphrey Stadium, just outside the boundary of the Little Mogadishu. This Somali food is heavy, Samakab said to Stone. You and the boy want to run some of it off? My buddy works at the Humphrey. We can go over there and toss the ball around. some of those people, um, of course, Sandy sitting here next to me. Uh, do you remember that, that meal we had over there? The meal was delicious. Yes. Uh, it's not the first time that you had a Somali food. No, but it may have been the best. I, mean, I would encourage everyone to try it. It tastes so good. And, uh, and when we spent a time in the restaurant, that brought up a memories. Seeing the Vikings Stadium right next to us. Uh, or watching the Vikings game or somehow some of the days just running on the field. That brings back a memory. Uh, so this related to us more information and different perspectives that the characters that was in the book that lighted up and shows up 30 and 20 years 10 years ago reflections yeah I remember that was the first time you sat there and basically interviewed for me for a couple of hours the first time I really got your full story mm -hmm. and I've known you for years at that point so you don't know the person unless you ask him try to, you could be a friend, but you might not know him or her deep down unless you ask. And in our culture, if you don't ask, you don't tell. You got to make the person very comfortable and try to ask. So I'm glad you asked. So now you know more. You didn't know I had a kid. friends to seven years. So. Okay, so I'll read one more passage and then, then that will be it. Um, and ask, you can ask questions. Ask questions. Um, so as I said earlier, um, while um, their son, Amir, um, is, is like what actually happened here, is recruited by um, ISIS, and he ends up going to Syria and Iraq, becomes completely radicalized. Um, and the what really pushed him over the edge, and you all will probably recall the case at the Crossroads Mall, where um, a Somali man went, essentially radicalized Somali man, went crazy with a knife, and was St. Cloud. Cloud and was um, killed by an off-duty policeman who unfortunately for him happened to be a, a weapons trainer. Um, and that's fictionally in the book what pushes Amir over the edge. A few days after that he, he goes to Syria. So that's one side of the radical, radical radicalization equation. The other is, as I mentioned earlier, the, um, this, this white supremacist, supremacist or fascist that have emerged all over the country and in the most surprising places like the White House. Um, so um, the Minneapolis, the Minnesota law, law enforcement authorities play a very key role in this. The, the um, climax of the book takes place in Stillwater Prison. Um, it involves a white supremacist gang. Um, and the, uh, the 
match for all of this is a is a uh, fired Minnesota Minneapolis um, a woman uh, police officer. Is a woman police is a police officer who goes to St. Cloud and gets hired hired there, and she becomes profoundly radicalized. When you look at radicalization, um, the common denominator tends to be abuse as a child, um, feelings of of uh, inequity, disenfranchisement. She uh, taken. I mean, it's always funner to write. It's it's funner to write about to create an evil character because um, evil is so ambiguous, actually, and it's. I, I don't believe any of us are born that way. Um, but this character, her name is Lilith Poe, um, embodies all of those, all of that. And so I'll just read kind of how she starts in life. Lilith Poe's father was a Minneapolis beat cop who shot first and asked questions later. A brutal man, a racist, with hands like truncheons, a bulbous, grotesque nose spread across his face like dimpled silly putty, and a spider web of broken capillaries on either side from too many vodkas and too much ranch dressing on his deep fried cheese curd. He once caught Lilith and a high school boyfriend making out on the living room couch after a date and slapped him so hard that blood ran from the 17-year-old's ears. Lilith's, mother's, Lilith's mother learned the hard way not to question her husband and barely stirred from her crochet when he reeled and stumbled upstairs to tuck in Lilith, cowering under the bed covers when she heard the heavy thump of his boots ascending the wooden stairs. She knew what was coming once or twice a week, and lay quiet as a mouse under the sheets, she tucked tightly around her little body in a child's futile attempt to protect herself from the demons of night terror. Her father slowly opened the bedroom door and a triangle of light crept across the floor over the stuffed animal and stopped. There's my little lady, he whispered. She smelled vodka on his breath as he leaned over her and cigarette smoke on his fingers when he pulled back the sheets to fondle her with one hand and pleasure himself with the other. Lilith never told anyone about the abuse, rationalizing that it was her duty. She hated him with every fiber in her body and loved him in the same way a condemned man yearned for his execution. She followed in her father's footsteps in all ways joining the Minneapolis police force after graduating from St. Cloud State, but she was forced to resign following two suspensions for excessive use of force against detained black men, venting her conflicted feelings for her father and repulsion for people of color. Lilith had not been procured into radicalism by some Svengali of the internet or by some older seducer, but the illness grew organically in her like a runaway virus and infected everything she ladies over there whether any of that rings familiar. Yeah, it was really wonderful. And I'm so happy to buy the book. Me too. Very heavy, yeah. And so many people were trying to come, but you know, the registration, they took the credit card. So the next time, you know, in our culture, <laughs> people, when you can register, it, they think it's full booked. <laughs> Well, they can watch it on Somali TV. I did yeah. a uh, yeah. an interview for the Voice of America Somali service. Uh, 